right, so we're here with Ty, owner of Dynamic Import Service, and he is an expert in 80s, 90s, 2000 BMWs, and everything in between. <laughs> Maybe not an expert, but definitely an enthusiast. All right, so. we'll go with enthusiast. But this place is awesome, and they specialize in everything German and other brands too, right? Yeah, you know, so just recently we started doing more like Audi, VW, um, Mercedes. I like Land Rover, so we started doing those, and nice. honestly, nobody else wants to touch them, so that seems to be kind of a niche. But uh, most of my guys and myself came from a background of BMW, BMW dealership techs. So, um, Probably all told, maybe 50, 60 years of BMW experience. Um, our shop foreman actually started in 1991. So wow. he was doing like CPO inspections on these cars when they were <laughs> three years old coming off lease. Unreal. So yeah. So we're focusing today on the E28 5 Series, which is quickly becoming a desirable classic. And it was a car built over a number of years, even like a couple of decades, right? So it actually was 81 to 88. Oh, so um, it was just in the 80s. Yeah, okay. yep. So um, a lot of similarities with the previous generation, which was an E12, that was the first five series. Um, you know, some of the middle part of the body, glass, doors were lightly changed from that car. Uh, but mechanically, it's a completely different car. Um, one of the first things I think that really caught on um, with the mid, like, mid to upper market of cars in the US, I mean, 2002s have been a around for a while. They were kind of a weird, freaky cult car that, you know, certain people were into, but it wasn't something you saw every day. Yeah. And this is kind of the first mainstream BMW, I think, that really, I guess, got Americans thinking about sedans could actually be fun sports cars that handle well, not, you know, a Chevy Impala that handles like a couch. So, so for a long time, these cars were very, dis very affordable. <laughs> yeah. And in one term, you almost described to me as like disposable. Yeah, and I think European cars in general, most of them go through that dip where they get to be 15 years old and there's really no prestige to having it anymore. Like nobody's trying to get props for being seen in a 15 year old car. <laughs> so at that point they really dive down because the maintenance costs start to add up. Most of them are high mileage and people look at that and say, I don't really want to spend two grand a year keeping a 15 year old car running. Mm. Um, so almost all BMWs have gone through that period. Um, they languish on used car lots in people's backyards, things like that. So I started in, with BMW in the early 2000s and we would honestly just buy like E30s and E28s and like crash them into each other, driving around <laughs> kind of like, uh, you know, un unlicensed racing in the <laughs> road. But, uh, you know, like everything that 80s stuff, you know, I grew up, in the late 80s, early 90s, and never dreamed the fashion, the cars, anything would catch on. But right. the whole like rad movement has come around, and these cars have definitely gotten caught up in that. Um, I mean, the styling's awesome, and then people, I think, now kind of miss driving a car that doesn't have electric power steering, that doesn't have so many nannies and controls that you are kind of left out of the experience. So, so let's talk about some of the advantages of owning an old 5 Series from this generation, the E28. Um, what are some of like the basic pros and what are some of the basic cons that someone should know? Just, you know, high yeah. level. So um, I guess the pros at this point is people seem to actually think they're cool, which, <laughs> uh, you know, certain amount of people always thought they were cool and have driven them the whole time. But, um, you know, there's some cultural stuff now that around the 80s and just you know, nostalgia for that time period. Um, driving wise, you know, it's very connected feeling car. Uh, they seem to feel smaller the faster you go. Uh, you don't end up with like driving a boat like some of the cars now. I mean, so many things now are crossovers, giant electric power steering, buzzy two liter turbo. Right. This is, you know, a big torquey inline six that is, the power is really linear, which is nice. Um, you know, it pulls throughout the rev range. You can wrap it out to six grand and it makes good noise and sounds, sounds good and fun the whole time. So. so what are some of the cons, like high level that people should know about the E28s? I mean, any old car, you're gonna run into stuff. Um, these are a bit weird because even if you've had older cars like carbureted era cars, 2002s or old domestic stuff, that stuff is actually easier to work on and fix hmm. mechanically than this, especially electronically because I kind of liken the computer systems on these cars to an Atari. They are smart enough to work, but they are really not smart enough to have any kind of self-diagnostic capability. So a lot of times when they're acting up, it just comes down to having some experience with it and knowing 
the trouble spots to look for. Right. So if you're owning one of these cars and you're not near a shop that specializes in them, they can end up being a headache. You know, you can get these weird little running issues that somebody that's been doing it for 10 years will just go, oh yeah, that's this. And they'll put, you know, one sensor, one meter on and everything's good. Where if you're kind of just out in the wild trying to do it on your own, you might, you might end up, yeah, you might end up scratching <laughs> your head for a long time. So that would probably be the biggest drawback. Um, you know, creature comforts, I think these cars are actually really good because they're uh, the oldest classics that you can drive like a real car. Interesting. You okay. know, like I love 2002s and I've spent a lot of time in 2002s. I've spent a lot of time in old domestic stuff from the 50s and 60s. And daily driving a 2002 is a commitment. I mean, <laughs> you're not, the windows don't seal up. <laughs> right. You know, there's no sound insulation. You're probably doing 4,000 RPM at 65 miles an hour. So it's fun. You're probably not gonna get your significant other on board. You're probably not gonna have your kids that interested in it because it's gonna smell like gas, it's gonna leak air, it's gonna leak water. And this is like, it's old, it's a classic, but it's a real car. You know, you've got AC, you've got power steering, you've got cruise, you've got power windows, power seats, power brakes, you know, all the stuff that people are used to. So I feel like as far as classic goes, a lot more approachable That's cool. than, you know, the older stuff. And, you know, um, right now cheaper. Right. As of right now, yeah. you know, 2002s, there again, used to be a $500 throwaway car. Now a decent <laughs> one's 30 grand. So, right. you know, go figure. But. Now we'll talk about the pricing on these kind of more toward the end of the video. Sure. But 81 through 88, pretty large production run. Yeah. Talk to me through some of the different models. And we're very fortunate because Ty has actually lined up a good collection of cars here. So walk me through what is available to U.S. consumers and maybe what could be imported and that kind of thing. Yeah. So um, the kind of lowest model would be like a 518 or a 520. They were never brought here, uh, but they had an M10 four cylinder that even like the 518s were carbureted. Mm, and wow. so okay. if you can imagine a carbureted 110 horsepower ish engine in a car this size, not very fun. Not uh, a great formula. So they never really knew, they knew that that wouldn't be something that would work on interstates and American roads. So those never came here. Um, the main things that you'll encounter here are like a 528E so that's um, a kind of mileage focused engine that um, it's an M20. So smaller displacement and mainly focused on ec economy. I mean, the gas crunch was around that time. So they, everybody was trying to make something on the range that would be in the high 20s, 30s. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, you know, that was a big concern for people. Um, so you see a lot of those around. Um, they're more affordable than 535s. And, um, you know, they don't have the performance. So right. you just, you kind of give that up. But if you want the look and you're not out trying to blow the tires off, then, yeah. you know, you can get into them a lot cheaper. Um, so a lot of the cars you'll see in the US, though, are the 535s, like this car. Yeah, I mean, I would say, maybe half and half. Um, and then the early ones were 533s, okay. which was a slightly different engine. It was still an M30, uh, but just a little bit smaller. And um, they made some advancements through that, through the range. Um, the 535s got a better transmission. Hmm. They went from a, a Getrag uh, 260 to 265, a little bit for your transmission. Um, you can get limited slip on, on some of the bigger engine cars. So, uh, and then, Obviously, everybody knows about M5s. Right. I don't have an M5. If That's anybody okay. wants to give me one, we'll do a separate we'll, video we'll on one. one. Yeah, you know. right. But uh, the two, like if you were looking specifically at 535s, the two configurations in the US would be just a standard 535i, okay. which is this car. Yep. Um, all American cars had what everybody affectionately calls the diving board bumpers. Okay. Um, just a five mile an hour bumper that was a US requirement. These things actually seem to kill themselves. This car's never been run into anything, but just from time and vibration, the bumpers crack. It's a pretty common issue. Okay, good to know. Cosmetic, I mean, I don't know how these cars do in accidents generally compared <laughs> to anything new, but um, so that's something, you know, that's every US spec car has those, whether it's a 528, 533, 535. Um, a lot of people do Euro bumper conversions, which okay. used to be cheap. Um, people would send over the headlights, the, the grills, the bumpers from Europe from scrap cars because they don't keep stuff as long. Sure, right. So when you but say now, it used to be cheap, like what yeah. would that cost now? I mean, you used to probably be able to get one for 500 bucks, now probably two grand Wow. With, okay. within the last three or four years. Wow. So um, yeah, I thought about doing this car when I got it like three years ago, didn't pull the trigger in time and then ended up 
kind of priced out of that. And, you know, to me, I, these are the ones I grew up with, so I kind of like the diving board bumpers yeah, just because right. it's very 80s and distinct. But um, so, yeah, and with the standard 535i, you, some of them had fog lights, which this, this one's kind of trashed, but uh, there's no front valance or air dam. Good to know. Um, and they don't have a limited slip differential. Okay. So if you're trying to go fast, that helps. Um, inside, you don't get sport seats. So these are just like the standard comfort seats. Um, they're fine. I mean, they're still better than most of the seats out there, but they're not cool looking. Um, then as you go to the back, the uh, no spoiler. So the IS okay. has a spoiler. Yep. Um, and yeah, also so the huge bumpers in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was something that was required by the US government. And if you look at like a lot of European cars from the mid to late 70s and early 80s, they have these tacked on bumpers, you know, Triumph Spitfires and stuff with <laughs> right, the big, big, huge rubber things, <laughs> MGBs that got lifted four inches and have a giant bumper. So all the manufacturers did it different ways. They probably did a cleaner job than most, but um, there again, another thing that people do with these, which, you know, it's messing with the safety equipment. So you can, the, there are like dampers behind it, shock absorbers, and you can actually drill holes in those and let the fluid out and then push the bumper oh, in. Interesting. Um, yeah, so interesting. yeah, that gives it a little bit more tucked in look. You can push it in probably two inches. But then you're, you're you compromise the, the bumper. The crash safety you know, the bumper, yeah. Not that most people are like that interested in safety if they're in one of these. That's, that's another thing. Obviously, you don't have any airbags. <laughs> right. These cars do mostly have ABS and a lot of them still work, yep. um, which is cool. But you do, you know, anytime you're driving something that's 30 years old, you're not gonna have the safety you have now. I mean, right. the worst car made now is probably better than the best car from 88. From 80s, yeah. And that's any, I mean, that's not a BMW thing, so. So walk me through uh, this car. So this is something a little bit special. Yeah, so this one's an IS, which was the higher spec American car. Um, they wanted something sporty that wasn't an M5 because most people didn't want to pay for an M5 or take care of the maintenance. So this was kind of their solution. Um, you get this front balance with the integrated fog lights. Um, so that's the main difference on the front rather than just having like a pan that rolls under. Um, the interior is quite a bit going on different, um, you got different seats and then depending on spec, you could get a different steering wheel an M Sport steering wheel. Uh, this car doesn't have to have one, but actually this one next to it does. So that's an automatic transmission. So you could get the IS with the auto. You could. Yeah. If you wanted to go like full, look cool, but actually just a cruiser mode, <laughs> um, mechanically very little difference. Um, they did have a limited slip rear differential and um, slightly different shocks. But okay. for the most part, you're just kind of looking cool. Um, you got the spoiler on the back, you know, with some definitely 80s ribbing. And uh, yeah, so they sold a lot of these because like today, a lot of people would be more concerned with looking like they were in a performance car than, you know, paying the extra bucks for the, the actual thing. Now, one thing, um, well, we learned about with ours, but I'm also seeing on this, the power antenna. Oh yeah, that's, you know, I would say maybe one out of a hundred of these still work. <laughs> you can probably pop in about an, any aftermarket one that you want and uh, and make it work if that's something you're into. But that was the height of technology at this time. So. And then let's talk about this car. Yeah. Um, which, which I have a little bit of history with. Yep. <laughs> this is um, a car that was never sold here in the U.S., right? Yeah, yeah. And so this was, um, there are different versions of this car. Um, you know, the European version came with the, was it M88, M88 right? Mm -hmm. So that that was just for Europe. This is a Japanese spec car that obviously I got from you guys. Right. Um, it showed up here, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, now this is an M535, so it's kind of like a lot of the M go fast looking bits, but without the actual yeah, M engine. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you think about like Audi S-Line and BMW M Sport, it's kind of the, the original version of that where, People want to have the look of the performance version. They don't want to pay for it. Right. <laughs> they don't want the maintenance, yeah, you sure. know, that sort of stuff. So this body kit and this setup was never sold in the U.S. primarily because of the bumper regulations. Okay. Um, Good to know. Yeah, so you can have these small, nice looking bumpers that were obviously what BMW had in mind when they designed the car. Um, and I also noticed like it looks like the headlight treatment's a little different. Yep, yeah, so they have bigger headlights on the outside which not really sure why they ditched that in the US, it's pretty cool. Um, that's another popular part of the 
swapping a euro front end um, is to swap to those headlights. Cool. Very cool. But um, as you can see, these guys um, have some access points for like tow hooks yep. that get a little bit dangly. Sure. Um, <laughs> I haven't yet, but I'm going to actually screw all these in with little screws from the bottom. That's something you run the risk of with any body kit, but right. um, they kind of uh, aren't quite to the same quality as the rest of the car. So when someone's looking to buy an E28, um, talk me through some of the values and then what what should they be trying to, to spend? Should they go for a nice one or should they go for more of a project and try to make it nice? Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on what you enjoy. Mm -hmm. If you want to hop in a classic car and drive away, then, you know, spend as much money as makes sense for you. So you just, you spend the most time driving rather than screwing around with it. Sure, right. Um, you know, I think that's something that I've had a few customers fall into. They think that they want a project car and then they get overwhelmed with it. It doesn't run and it sits. For a lot of people, depending on, you know, that are just car enthusiasts and not mechanics, getting an old car and keeping it going is enough of a project, let alone buying something that needs a bunch of work up front. I think that's when people really get overwhelmed by the expense and the time required. So, you know, kind of depends on what you're after. Like this was a very cheap car, um, 1500 bucks. Wow. And it was a commuter that I bought from a customer. It's got, I think 260,000 miles on it. Wow. Um, I just, I like to mess with them and I liked the fact that it was all completely stock and original. So, I bought it for that and then had, um, I have a, like another company that does all cosmetic stuff. So I had a paint correction done on it. This is all original paint that was wet sanded top to bottom, extensive paintless dent repair on it to get it as good as we could without painting anything. So um, this is two years after that was done and it's my daily, it doesn't, it's not inside at all. So it can look a lot better than this, but um, so I spent a pretty significant amount of money trying to rescue this paint just because I like the originality. Um, so but, what, would, what would this car, do you think, if, if good, good day, good market, what is this car worth today, approximately? I mean, I've been offered like 12 for it, 12,000. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I've done a lot to it with between that and then um, we redid the suspension. So it's got lowering springs, um, bigger sway bars that we were um, actually required welded on brackets. Mm. Um, these style five wheels, which are, are great for these cars because they are from a E39 BMW 5 Series and they bolt straight on. Uh, so you can up the looks quite a bit nice. with that. It um, looks great. You can also take E34 front brakes, like later 5 Series front brakes and bolt them straight on. So under the surface, I've done quite a bit with this car. Right. Um, you know, and just the regular stuff, the um, bushings in the suspension, uh, bushings in the shifter. The shifters get really sloppy and loose over time. Good to know. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I've been offered 12, I didn't sell it. So I like it. I like having a car that doesn't have any like collector value per se. There's nothing unique or one off about it. Right. Cause then I can go out and use it. And when it gets door dings, things like that, I don't have to. And when it rains. Or yeah, not, yeah, I'm not like it. scrambling to go pull it inside. So, so you think like 12 to 20K will get you a pretty sorted, good solid yeah, running. Yeah, I mean, if you watch like bring a trailer and all that right. stuff, there's the oddballs that go for 40 things like that but oh, okay. you know if they've got provenance and you know good options things like that but if you want one to drive around i think you could probably get one even for eight or ten if you're not as concerned about cosmetics gotcha. you know that's where these cars get expensive because the they've all been around for 30 years and a lot of the 80s paint the clear coat stuff comes off so then you're kind of stuck either driving it and enjoying the way it is or spend a bunch of money on a paint job which yeah. So, so. Let, let's compare like a, a more valuable version to something on the more affordable end of the spectrum, right? What are the differences between a cheap E28 and an expensive E28? Um, you know, hopefully it's a lot better sorted out for the expensive one. Okay. Um, <laughs> sometimes they're just shiny, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we get a lot of cars in here that look really good and then um, you start digging into it and you realize that all they really did was buff it up and sell it. This car is kind of the opposite. Um, I actually originally bought this from another shop owner and then um, now our service manager bought it from me. But this car looks kind of rough and I bought it as part of a package deal, but mechanically it's in really good shape. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. Honestly, it's probably the fastest and smoothest running of any of these cars sitting here. Wow. So, you know, um, it was a guy that has been with BMW since the 80s that owned it. And so it was his daily. He didn't care about how it looked, but he kept it really mechanically sorted. 
So you can't really judge it can't really judge a book by its cover when it comes to old cars and really the only way to find out what you're getting is to take it to a specialist and Bring get it, it up get it up yeah. in the air you know find out what's going on um now, mechanically should, should people be pretty scared of high mileage cars is there like a number where you're like i wouldn't go over this no and that's really the nice thing about old bmw engines is um you see one with a quarter million miles and it runs great okay. you know um the issues that they have are the same issues BMW still have of oil leakage. Um, but outside of regular maintenance and keeping up on the oil and coolant leaks, the internal engines are probably more solid than anything BMW makes today. So, so do you think in this market you could get a, a really solid mechanical car with some cosmetic issues for under 8K? I would think, yeah. yeah. And also, you know, you you buy these from different people. You know, right. you. Like I bought this one for way too cheap from somebody who had had it for a long time and they just weren't thinking of it as a classic car. They were thinking of, I've had this car in my garage for a long time and I'm ready to have space. Right. And <laughs> then you buy another car from an enthusiast and you pay current retail of, you know, whatever bring a trailer says it's this worth. week. Yeah. yeah. And what about this black car? What's the story with this? That one was a, a Facebook find. Um, that's a 535 automatic. I. It doesn't currently go forward, so okay. Um, I haven't really even looked into it yet. Um, that was twenty five hundred bucks on Facebook Marketplace. It used to be that color uh, as the gray one, as you can see. Oh, some yeah, of the paints leaving. Um, so, not really sure what we're going to do with this yet. Um, these cars right now, I just anything that's with within like sixty or eighty miles in a decent price, I just go buy it and then figure out what to do with it later. Interesting. So, so they're kind of becoming harder to find, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of uh, 80s cars in general, you sure, know, right. you start to see, you know, cars that were thrown away and now people are after them. So, you know, this one, we might get it running and clean it up, try to sell it for four or five. Right. Maybe one of my guys will buy it. You know, we just kind of, it's here and uh, we'll figure out what to do with it. We've stepped into the 5 Series interior and first thing I got to say is, you know, like the quality of the materials in here really feels very good. Yeah, yeah, these seats are original to the best of my knowledge and they're now, you know, this is an 88, so they've been around a while and are holding up. Um, the nice thing with BMW interiors generally is even when you get a car, if it's dirty or, it, you know, kind of poorly maintained, the materials are good enough that you can clean them pretty heavily and they'll, they won't they will come apart, you okay. know. Um, so, yeah, nice leather treatment goes a long way with these cars. Um, now, what far, about the dashes? Yeah, yeah, what are some of the big issue points yeah so the probably the biggest thing especially here in Colorado or anywhere you get a lot of Sun uh, the dashes just start to crack um, it's this old material that shrinks over time and you end up with myriad cracks I mean this one is in really good shape this car spent its whole life inside um, you know if you look at any of these cars that have been outside for any period you're gonna have cracks everywhere um, different ways to go about it um, they make cheesy covers that you can just pop on the top they tend to warp too because they're black and they sit in the sun. Um, some people have taken them out, having them completely recovered, um, where you send it to a professional service. They grind all the cracks out, fill them, and then vacuum form a new cover onto it. Wow. Yeah, that's beyond probably what most people are interested in money-wise, um, but definitely services like that are out there. Um, but for the most part, you know, I live with whatever they whatever kind of shape they're in right now so so what about like part availability i mean are most of the trim pieces available window regulators that kind of thing yeah yeah most of the stuff's pretty easily available um and bmw actually has better parts support than any brand that i know of um i've worked with a lot of different brands over the years and there's some brands that if it's over like 15 years old they just laugh at you when you ask about it and bmw you know a friend of mine bought a 50 year old exhaust system for a, a 73 and bmw had it on the shelf in germany so <laughs> the thing even things you wouldn't think to ask about it's never worth or it's always worth trying and just giving them a call because um they have a really strong dealer network a lot of the dealers have been in business since the cars were new you know in the 70s and bmw hasn't changed ownership in that time so you know a lot of times Brands change ownership, they clean house, and all those old parts just get sold off where BMW's still got them, so. Really um, cool. Yeah, yeah, that's been that's really a lifesaver cool. in a few cases, so. All right, so what else do we know about in here? What about the, the, the moonroof or the sunroof? Yeah, um, give it a shot, it might work. Um, there, if you have to actually get in there and start working on it, it's pretty involved, um, trying to get these headliners out in one piece without destroying them. Um, so that would be something 
you know, probably best left to somebody with some experience. Okay. Um, so don't it, touch them, it sounds like. If you really need a sunroof, <laughs> yeah, but all the windows open, you know, so you got most of the airflow you're going to want there, and you, um, yeah, I mean, you're kind of tempting fate opening a 30-year-old sunroof. Sure. So, what about um, these little computers? They had these really on the left side of the steering wheel there. Yeah, the right yeah, oh, so the right side this, these were, you know, super high-tech innovation in the 80s. They were kind of just trying to, like, tack computers onto things for technology cred, I guess. Um, so... They, a lot of them will still work. Um, the internal batteries tend to kind of corrode. They're just old, like, 80s batteries. And if you go find an 80s toy and open it up, you're going to see all that stuff coming apart. That's basically what these do. Um, people have, like, triage modern batteries into them, and the board and everything survives. But um, if you really want to know, like, your range and your average mile per gallon, you can go for that. <laughs> but I haven't worried about it all that much. Um, this was another BMW innovation, the check control center. Yeah. So when you turn on the key, um, it gives you warnings on anything that might not be currently working right. And then you'll get a blinking light down here, which a lot of people mistake for uh, a check engine light, which it's not. It just is saying something up here needs your attention. So, you know, I've had people jump in my E28s, take them out before, and they're like, oh, God, the check engine light's blinking, and it's actually, you have a brake light out, oh, or your washer fluid right. is low. So, um, in order to get that to stop blinking, you just have to push this check button to acknowledge that you looked at this and then, you know, deactivated that little warning system. Gotcha. So, it's kind of fun, you know, um, looking back at what was high tech at the time, <laughs> you know. So, right. um, yeah. The HVAC system, people have issues with those, um, just finicky electronics. This actually, I haven't had any issues with mine personally, so I haven't dealt with that too much. They're kind of funny in that they have a heater fan that is inside the dash and then an AC fan that is here in the console. Wow, interesting, okay. So you've got two different fans depending on what you're running. Um, we have had to redo these a few times, but you know, not, not on a level that I think is considered out of the ordinary for a car of this age. So, um, Were yeah. they R12 originally, do you know? Yep, yeah, okay. they're R12. They take really well to being converted. Um, I've actually seen a few cars that have been converted without anything other than draining them and then putting on the fittings. Wow. So, you know, if you want to convert a car properly, there's this huge big thing that you're supposed to do if you want to just put some R134 in there. The chances are it'll probably work right. uh, if the rest of the system's intact, you know. Um, they're pretty basic systems, so you're probably not going to run into a ton of issues with them. But if you find a car and you're buying a car and the belt is off the compressor, there's probably something going on with the compressor. So just kind of a red flag. If you're somebody that's super interested in the AC working, that might be something to look for, like on an inspection to try to get ahead of finding a new compressor because they're not the easiest to find. And, uh, now, what about the power seat controls? Because these had some of the wackiest power seat controls. Yeah, they were really going all out, you know, <laughs> much like today. Um, they were trying to find ways to justify the expense of the cars. So they just added tons of options and, you know, power headrests that go up and down. Don't know that I've ever seen any that worked. Um, you can go forward, back, lean angle, leaning the, back, the bottom front to rear. Um, they... The ones that I've had all work, um, it's kind of hilarious how fast they move. You push forward and it's like, shoo, but really? wow. yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, they seem to be a pretty solid system. So, um, you know, uh, most of the 535s that I've had have had power seats. Um, it just kind of depends on who bought it originally and how they optioned it. So guys, this is really cool. We're here with Pete, who's owned a bunch of these cars and you've worked on these for decades, right? Yeah, off and on. Off and on. Throughout the years, yeah. I love that. Kind of rediscovered my love for them. You can hear so. a humble gentleman at its finest here. <laughs> but we're going to talk about specifically the engine on these 5 Series from the 80s and talk about some of the things you need to look for. Now, what was the engine code that BMW used? Uh, these are, it's the M30 engine family. Okay. Um, and then the second part of that is a B34, which denotes uh, displacement. So it's a 3.4 liter. Interesting, okay. Yeah. So M30 is a family. It's the engine family, yeah. And then the second part will actually yeah. tell you how large the engine is. Yeah. So I think, I was reading the other day, it's like 30, roughly 30 years that, that this engine was, was put into, wow. into BMWs, yeah, and through various chassis and, you know, displacements and injection systems, so. Now we talked about yeah. this a little earlier with Ty, but it sounds like the basic block in these engines can last several hundred thousand miles. Has that been your experience? Yeah, they seem to be quite robust. 
Yeah, yeah that's cool. So. Now let's talk about some of the things that someone should look for if they're shopping for like a 535 in this case. What are some of the common failure points and what are some of the expensive parts to fix? Uh, one of the big failure points on these, there is, uh, it's an oil spray bar. I don't know what the correct term for it is, sure. but it sits above the camshaft and is fed oil through some banjo bolts. Those banjo bolts uh, can either loosen up or they'll plug up, especially if it hasn't had frequent oil changes or prop, prop, been properly serviced. Uh, when that happens, it doesn't lubricate the cam lobes properly and it'll end up what we call wiping the cam, but essentially it'll, the, the cam will grind itself to little pieces. So Interesting. Okay. that's kind of a big issue. Um, usually it doesn't harm the engine, but the car tends to run pretty poorly. Now, until can, that's you, can you tell when you're looking at a, like a pre-purchase inspection on one, can you tell when um, like the cam is starting to fail pretty quickly? Uh, you can if you remove the valve, the valve cover. Okay, so, so you, you yeah. do have to remove the valve yeah. cover to really know. It's never a bad idea if both parties are, you know, willing to do that. It's a pretty quick and easy process. So, you know. Now, if you do have to replace a cam on this engine, is that a pretty in-depth job? But what would that typically run you? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, no problem. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. One? Yeah. Uh, it's been a while, but yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, sounds like the bottom of bottom end of the engine is pretty robust. Yeah, the bottom end, top end, all very strong. You know, I think uh, something that comes to mind, maybe rocker arms when you start spinning these engines pretty high, but you know, that's kind of a, those are unique circumstances when you're, right. you're driving on the track constantly. Which, yeah. You know. <laughs> fuel injection systems, pretty yeah. self-explanatory or are they yeah. pretty Yeah, fuel injections, very, very solid. Um, you know, some things that you want to look out for. Uh, the air flow meter, which measures the air mass uh, the engine is drawing in. Those can be a little finicky, and if they're not set up properly and adjusted, um, you know, it can really, it really has a big effect on the way the car performs. Wow. So, you know, something to keep in mind. Uh, all the rubber components, vacuum lines, all that stuff breaks down over time. You're likely going to have to do it if it hasn't been done. Um, you know, having big air leaks, you know, say if this boot was split or something in the system after this, this air, air flow meter is open, it's just, it's drawing in air that the car cannot account for so kind of you get some poor running issues especially when it's you know at idle right kind of poor idle quality interesting so. now one comment we get all the time from people is saying you know i would never buy an old bmw because you require so much specialty knowledge and specialty tools to keep them on the road have you found that to be true or are they pretty user serviceable if you're willing to get your hands dirty and spend some time with them do your research um you know i think i think it can, it can prove to be a very a very good car okay it'll, it'll serve you well um, but there is a lot of truth to that. You, you do have to know what you're doing. Okay. Um, and it can be trial and error. That's fine. But if you're not patient with one of these, you know, it might not be the best car for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> if, if, unless you're paying somebody to do it, to do the work, yeah. you know, so. Now, what about the um, timing system? Any, like, major faults with the timing chain or, or anything in that realm? Yeah, nothing, nothing really to speak of. I mean, yeah, I, I think, you know, you do have the guide rails, which can fail. Um, I personally haven't seen it, but, you know. It, it is a possibility, but nothing really comes to mind. Okay. It, it's all, it's all, you know, they had a lot of time to dial this engine in. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And cooling system. Uh, you know, cooling systems quite robust as well. You, you know, you have a lot of connections that potentially can leak. So you want to keep an eye out for it. You know, a lot of the hose connections, stuff like that. Stuff, right. Coolant tends to seep through those, um, radiators, you know, they'll, they'll leak on the, on the side tanks or the, the vent hose up top here. Sometimes there's a, there's a nipple that this vent hose connects to that can break pretty easily. Um, so one concern that I would have if I was shopping for, especially an 80s BMW, right, is we started to see a lot of electronics kind of come into play, right? They have those little, little computers on the inside. We see stuff like the diagnostic ports. How are the electrical systems on these cars? Are they pretty robust or do you see like specific problems that fail all the time or is all thing fail? What, what's kind of the situation? Uh, you know, they're actually quite robust. Yeah? A car of this age, it's shocking how much stuff <laughs> works okay on a on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. yeah 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 generally you know most of it like i had this car here it pulled out of a junkyard sat for i don't know year year or two and who knows how long before then and you, you start pressing buttons stuff initially doesn't work and then you give it a, <laughs> a couple more more presses and, and it comes to life and now everything works nice. you know it's a it's it's all quite robust uh, you know some of the insulation not on the wire itself but the like the rubber insulation to protect it that stuff kind of falls apart, but the wiring itself seems to be okay. Um, the one thing I will say, the fuse block, fuse box, yeah, um, it, you know, that is something to consider upgrading okay. at some point, just because it has these old, uh, old style fuses, um, which can be a little finicky. Sometimes you have to pull the cover off and turn them to get stuff 
to get uh, you know create a good connection of power flow them flow through them. Right. Um, I think in some cases you can have some a thermal event, <laughs> if you will. If that's what yeah. the engineer would love yeah, to yeah. call it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. A thermal event. <laughs> a thermal event. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've seen a couple of melted fuse boxes. Um, Transmissions are they pretty good? Uh, yes. Um, you know, honestly, I can't speak to the reliability of the automatics. The manuals are quite good, um, especially the manuals that were installed in the I think the would have been 87 through 88. Okay. Um, we're pretty robust. The 86 cars and back, all the way back to the 533s, those were considered a little bit weaker, but I think, you know, if, if, you're, if you take your time moving through the gears, you're, you're gonna be okay. So Ty, you bought this car and it looked like that. Yeah, so this is a commuter for a couple decades and uh, had some pretty sizable dents. We were able to do PDR on those, so we didn't have to paint that. Uh, wow, and you made it look like this with not a lick of paint. Yeah, yeah. Unreal. Um, yeah, so all thanks to Julio, Odd Dynamic Auto Salon team. You can kind of see somebody dripped acid or something on here. Mark's still here, but you know, we able to really minimize it. Oh yeah, look at that. Kind of Gorgeous. So now we're gonna put your five series up on the lift and this is a Colorado car, so it's looking pretty good, but what are some of the common areas where these cars rust? Yeah, so um, much like any car or any old car, under the battery tends to be a spot. Okay, um, yep. The you know, old school batteries that aren't sealed will burp and fume, and so you can see a little bit of surface rust here, but it's not uncommon to have a big hole you know, where the battery is supposed to be, right. or take a battery out and half the tray's gone. Okay. So that's probably worth a look in most places. Um, like you mentioned, here in Colorado, we're really lucky on the rust front, and uh, we don't have to deal with a lot of the structural rust that you see in other parts of the country that have harsher salt-covered winters. But what about like rocker panels, is that common? You know, um, apparently, not something I've dealt with, you know, having been in Colorado. Sure. Um, but yeah, you know, anything that's exposed underneath and starts to get rock damage, you know, you can kind of see this one how little rust problems we have is that's bare metal and it's barely even got any rust whatsoever. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, but they do have kind of a rubberized coating here on the bottom and if you get water under that, that can be an issue. Um, you can kind of see this stuff can trap water. Oh yeah. And uh, that can be an issue where it looks good from the outside but there's really nothing underneath anymore. Gotcha. Um, let's see here, go on up. So we were talking a little off camera and the reason we put this car on the lift is because it sounds like the suspension on these can be a little problematic. Yeah, you know, um, they're all old now. They're rubber bushings. Um, some of the cars have been in continuous use, but a lot of them have sat for extended periods and you know, the rubber just starts to come apart. Luckily, pretty much everything is readily available. Um, you don't really get into some of the issues you have with other brands where the manufacturers don't support them anymore. There's no aftermarket support. So um, about whatever you want for one of these cars, you could probably have at your house within a week. Wow. Uh, which is nice, especially you know, if you're gonna be approaching this as a do, like, do it yourself garage project. Um, and it's pretty easy to work on. Um, you know, like Pete mentioned earlier, some of the electronics and um, engine like management systems are, are a bit finicky, but this is all bolts and nuts and you can pretty much, what you see is what you get. Um, one thing that can be a bit of an issue, um, the steering boxes, so these are pre-rack and pinion, okay. and the steering boxes can tend to uh, wear internally, and then you get some play um, up and down here. It is adjustable, there's a, a tiny amount of adjustment, um, so you can tighten those up a little bit with like a, an adjuster on the top, but that, even that kind of has its limitations. And we also talked about tied into the power steering system, some of the cars also have the brake system. Um, runs off hydraulics. Right? Yeah, yeah, they, they have a hydro boost system that the power steering pump runs a, a hydraulic brake booster where most cars are vacuum operated. Um, so these ones, that can be a bit of an issue. Um, they frequently leak, sometimes leak um, to the point of making the power steering go low. 
And, um, but they are available rebuilt. You can actually even send yours out to be rebuilt. And you, also they're available new, which is kind of staggering for a car of this age and kind of a funky component um, that isn't that common. But luckily, you know, BMWs just generally have a good following. You know, um, there's an enthusiast for every generation and um, somebody knows where to get everything. So I've noticed you've got some kind of go fast goodies on here. What are the easiest ways to make these cars handle better? Yeah, um, so even before like you get to go fast stuff, the very first thing you're probably gonna wanna do is uh, these bushings. Uh, BMW in this era called them upper control arm bushings. Some people call them thrust arm bushings. Yeah. But those get soft and a really common performance issue with these cars is a wobble, mm. you know, from like 40 to 60, that range. It'll feel like you've got a wheel that's ready to come off. The steering wheel does this, and then you get past that range, and it levels out, um, basically because the wheels are just bouncing back and forth due to play in these bushings. Wow. So two different ways you could go about it. Um, they do have a ball joint in the other end, so some people elect to just replace the whole arm and bushing and everything. If the ball joint's OK, you can actually get just the bushings, and um, you can press them and, and press them out and press in new ones. Is that a pretty big uh, job? Well, if you have a press, it's not, <laughs> but uh, it is, it would be something not very fun to do at home. So what about like motor mounts, transmission mounts? Yeah, the motor mounts will come apart. Um, those are these guys right here. Luckily, they're about as easy as any motor mounts could ever be. Um, and they're spotty availability, but um, you can find poly ones, you can find the regular rubber ones. Um, these, uh, so the tie rods and the center link and the idler arm are probably a good recommendation for like a stage zero. That stuff's cheap and um, readily available. Probably spend a couple hours at tops doing it. You'll need an alignment afterwards, but it'll tighten up the steering quite a bit without getting into messing with the steering box. Nice. Yeah, and then on this car, um, I just was trying to make it handle a little bit better. Um, these are uh, style five BMW BBS two-piece wheels that were stock on E39s, like a 530 Sport. Um, it's about as much wheel as you can get on these cars. I had to slightly roll the fenders, but I was able to do 245s, 17 square all the way around. So 245, 40, 17. And uh, arguably too big of a tire because it will make it kind of wander a little bit. Okay. And <laughs> if there are like divots in the road, it'll kind of grab those and follow them around. Right. Um, so I'm sure there'll be some people out there that this is an abomination. Um, <laughs> but I like the look of it and uh, it, you know, tucks in pretty nicely with just kind of a finger width between the tire and the fender. Nice. And then any other driveline considerations, rear diff? Yeah, kind of um, the diffs are pretty bulletproof. Um, axles will probably need boots and maybe to be gone through. It's pretty, a lot more straightforward than you would think. Um, main thing is to get all the gunk cleaned out of these before you try to take them off. They're Allens and they'll strip out. Okay. Good so, but the axles actually just bolt in here flange to flange. So you don't have to dis you don't have to take the wheels off to pull the axles. Wow. Um, so you can take those out and there's rebuild kits out there from GKN at, that uh, take it apart, clean it, new boots, new grease, and refresh those. Um, these rear diff mounts occasionally will get some play in them and then you'll feel kind of a rocking, jerking in the rear end as you come on and off, like accelerating, decelerating. That's also pretty easy to get to, you know, one bolt here and four up there. Anything? One, yeah, keep going. Oh, yeah, another common issue with these on the rear suspension, um, while well, these guys, little, um, people call them dog bones, but they control the side to side movement of the control arms. When those get worn out, they're just little ball joints in there. These ones are trashed. <laughs> but uh, when those get worn out, you'll kind of feel like the back end wanders a little bit. And then probably the last big thing back here is the subframe mounts. So the whole rear suspension bolts in with just these three points, one of these on each side, and then that rear diff mount. And these are big bushings that will eventually wear out. And then you'll kind of the same thing as the rear one, you'll get rocking up and down of the subframe. And uh, is that a big job to fix? Yeah, mainly just because you need to, it's a pressed in bushing that's you know that big around. Um, so if you were gonna try to do it at home, you probably have to pull the whole rear diff out there is a sp or subframe out there's a special tool to do it in the car but that's also kind of hard to find at this point interesting now um what about are there any items so we talked about like bushings and stuff that wear out yeah anything that like cracked from the body and has to be welded or any of those issues? yeah um so under here the you can kind of see this here but 
they're kind of notorious for this um, steering box mount breaking. It's just this kind of U-shaped sheet metal tab that's welded onto the subframe. So that, if that breaks, you'll feel like the steering has two centers almost. It'll, the steering box will rock up and down. And one time you'll be going on the road and, and the steering wheel's centered and you're going straight and the next time it'll be off at like 10, 15 degree angle. And then you'll also hear clunking as it moves back and forth. Um, that's a real killer of how these things drive. There's no like long-term damage. So there's actually an aftermarket kit that you weld in a tube through here and it creates a much more solid mount. We do that pretty routinely on these when they, when they break and uh, that solves the problem forever. So that's pretty easy. Um, people have been known to have issues with the sway bar mounts breaking. Um, these are aftermarket sway bars from Ireland Engineering that are much larger and they actually require a welded on bracket. Oh, wow. It's a good performance upgrade, but you do need access to a welder and some skill with that right. um, welding, <laughs> new metal to old metal. But on this car, you know, I wasn't really looking for originality as much as I was looking for a fun driver. So we've got these up at the front and then the same kind of a setup at the back um, that also requires a bigger bracket to be welded on. Hmm. Um, that's something we can do in house, you know, um, and uh, that made a pretty big difference. What about, like the, handling. what about like the clutch? Any, anything you know about the clutch system? Yeah, um, that's in the car, but the, this is probably not all that common, but the clutch master cylinder bracket that's underneath the steering column, that's actually part of the main body. And over time, that metal it's, will fatigue. It's pretty thin. And um, I actually had this car. It broke away while I was driving. I lost the clutch completely. <laughs> uh, but if you get to do that, you've got to get in there and actually weld inside the car, which on an assembled car with carpet, can be kind of a hazard. Right. <laughs> sure. As and far as... Oh, yeah, no, no, go for it. As far as rust goes, um, you know, you can see rust in this area, in the, the lower rockers, like any car, um, if they don't drain right, you know, so they've got drain holes. This one's even got a little bit going there. Uh, spare tire wells, you know, a lot of times the trunk seals on these leak. There's a couple little drains right here that actually go into the car. If those get clogged up and then water sits in there, this will disappear, which is pretty common. Mm. Um, but, you know, as far as big time structural rust, they're better than some of the older cars, like 2002s that, and coupes, like E9 CS coupes were really susceptible to subframe mount rust. You know, your results will vary depending on where you're at. And any car, time you're buying a car like this, definitely spend some time underneath it with somebody that knows the cars to make sure that you're buying something that ha is a good starting point, right. you know. So Ty, it sounds like overall the cars are pretty solid. They are, you know, and that's, that's kind of another nice part about them is that it's a car, you know, that is a classic, but you're not just watching it fall apart in front of you, you know, like, yeah. um, like I said earlier, the, the doors seal up, most of the electronics work most of the time, and uh, they don't, you know, just spew fluids everywhere. <laughs> so great. yeah, yeah, you're in pretty good shape with one of these as far as, uh, spending most of your time keeping it on the road rather than just uh, trying to triage it. Now, Ty, if folks want to get a hold of you, if they want um, uh, to, to learn more about the shop, how can they do that? Yeah, so our website's www.dynamicimportservice.com, and then um, we, our phone number is 720-600-6085. We also you know, have a little bit of stuff going on Instagram, but nice. not much. So. Well, dude, I really appreciate all your help. This yeah, has of been course. such a fun deep dive. And guys, let us know what you think of this in the comment section below. I've got so much more planned with Ty. We're going to go into some of the most notorious BMWs, both good and bad. And we'll see you on the next episode. This is so fun. Thank you for your help, buddy. Oh, thank you, Ben. It's I been really fun. I really appreciate it.